First of all, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Susan Hegard. I'm the president of the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. And um, I'm coming to you live from our home <laughs> in St. Paul. Um, normally we'd be at our offices. We've been remote for the most part. And especially now our, our office is about three blocks from where the trial, uh, the Derek Chauvin trial occurred. So we're all staying home. We've been, we, there's a state of emergency actually in our state right now declared by the governor. Um, and this is a difficult time in our country. I just want to acknowledge that um, all across our country. And uh, I just wanted to extend my thoughts to all of you um, as we try to move forward at a difficult time. And, and I'll just say, I think uh, there's no better time to be talking about education. Um, so welcome everyone. And um, I'm gonna go through just kind of a summary of this event and then also some guidelines as we proceed. We know that you're all very, very busy. And so we wanna make good use of your time. And I wanna extend my gratitude to you for joining us. Uh, higher education is a critical element to getting our economies back up and growing, but it's also the place where legislatures and governors, I've worked for two of them, um, look to cutting funds to fill other gaps. This is no different in our states or anywhere else in the country. When the Gates and Lumina Foundation released their report, Higher Education Finance in the Post-COVID Era, I saw an opportunity to share the principles and strategies with our other Midwestern states. We started with an interactive webinar on February 5th to simply share the report and guiding principles for higher education funding and explore which ones would be interested in rolling up sleeves to dive in further. One of these principles is, uh, the third one is to support programs and strategies that advance credential completion. That is scheduled for this Thursday at 12.30 Central Time, and it's not too late to register if you haven't already. Today's session is about the fourth principle, to expand and invest to drive economic growth. We're pleased to have Elizabeth Salinas, Senior Research Associate at HCM Strategist, facilitating today's discussion. HCM Strategist was the primary research and policy analyst on the Gates and Lumina report. And they also support Lumina's Strategy Labs, which is supporting this webinar learning series. We're grateful to our speakers and colleagues who join us today to discuss the great work happening in their states Commissioner Teresa Lubbers of Indiana and Commissioner Peter Blake from Virginia. Before handing things off to Elizabeth to guide the way, and Elizabeth will introduce herself, a quick overview of the flow of our time together. And we're gonna to kind of play it by ear. We have a smaller group, um, which I think is great. We're recording the session. Um, and so we'll make this available on our website and through our newsletter um, and, and social media and that sort of thing. We're gonna spend about 35 minutes together as a group learning about the principle and the efforts in Indiana and Virginia. Uh, we'll spend five or 10 minutes for Q&A. And then the idea was that we'd move into a breakout, a brief breakout session, just two of them, I think today, to further talk about um, um, ideas and efforts. And this is to provide you with space to talk about and get feedback on efforts that might be underway, or maybe just ideas and to get input from your peers and colleagues from other states. Then we'll come back to the space for sharing and a closeout. If you have a question, I would encourage you to stick it in the chat or raise your hand and um, I will try to catch those softballs and, uh, and make sure that Elizabeth um, is able to respond or one of the speakers is able to respond. Um, let's see what else. Um, we're gonna, we'll, we'd like you to mute yourselves, <laughs> stifle yourselves, mute yourselves um, while the presentation's going on. Um, and if you're not able to do that, we're, Katie's great at, um, at muting folks. Um, again, the session's being recorded and we'll make the um, presentation and slides available on our website after the event. So with that, I'm gonna hand this off to Elizabeth Salinas. Elizabeth? Great, thank you so much, Susan. Um, thank you for that helpful framing and for your acknowledgement of the, the difficult and challenging times that, that folks are facing right now across the country. Um, and thank you to Mac and Lumina Foundation for supporting this series of webinars on this topic, which is very critical, especially um, in our current environment. Um, so my name is Elizabeth Salinas. I am a senior research associate with HCM Strategists. HCM is a public policy and advocacy consulting firm focused on redis reducing disparities through education and training opportunities. We provide strategic guidance to a broad set of clients, including governor's offices, state agencies, um, and philanthropic foundations, among others. 
Uh, my work at HDM focuses on policy research and analysis on a number of policy areas, including affordability and financial aid, post-secondary finance, and longitudinal data systems. And I'm grateful um, to be joining you this morning in partnership with MEC and with support from Lumina Foundation Strategy Labs. And I do have a slide deck, so I'll just share my screen. Please bear with me. Can I get a thumbs up folks can see? Perfect. And as Susan mentioned, I'm joined this morning by Peter Blake and Teresa Lovers, and I'm looking forward to introducing them and engaging them in conversation. Um, but I would love to just provide some grounding context for that conversation, um, as well as for us to keep in mind um, for this session. And I actually would like to start with, um, by taking us back to some questions that were posed in that February webinar that, that Susan referenced, which are how can states um, best navigate the interrelated conditions of COVID-19 and the historical and structural roots of inequities within higher education? And how can states um, target post-secondary investments effectively to ensure a more sustained and equitable recovery? And so that webinar in February really focused on hearing from folks on how they were navigating these questions. And I encourage you, um, if you weren't able to attend that meeting to um, visit the MEC website, the recording is available there as well as the slide deck. Um, so you can have a chance to, to review those materials. And so that conversation was also grounded in the higher ed budgets for the post COVID era report that Susan also referenced in her welcoming remarks, which was put out by Lumina Foundation and the Gates Foundation. And a number of my HDM colleagues and I were able to support the development of that report. And we are very pleased to see and hear that it is resonating with folks um, across the field. And again, I encourage you to check out um, that webinar and um, to read the report if you haven't had a chance to go through it um, again. And that webinar um, from February goes into more detail on each of these principles, but I did just want to provide a very high level overview to provide some context for this morning's conversation. And so these principles were really designed as a framework to help those that make decisions about budgets for higher education, both in the current COVID environment, but also really resetting and thinking more about the longer term um, and really trying to shift how we approach investing in post-secondary education. Again, I'll, I'll give a very high level overview. Principle one really focuses on intentionally directing resources to those institutions that are best equipped to serve individuals that have been most impacted by COVID-19. And which we know even before COVID, those institutions have traditionally been underserved and underfunded. Principle two focuses on expanding and targeting need-based financial aid. So that again, those that have been most affected by COVID have access to post-secondary training and educational opportunities. Principle three is about supporting student success and acknowledging that it's not just about ensuring folks have access to post-secondary, but also have the supports that they need to be successful and to complete their credentials. Principle four, which is what we will do a bit of a deeper dive on today, really focuses on leveraging other resources beyond the traditional funding streams that we've used in the past to fund and support higher education. And principle five really recognizes that there are opportunities for improvement in system and institutional cost structures, um, and really trying to optimize for efficiency and reducing redundancies. And so again, I encourage you to read the report if you haven't already done so, um, and to check out that webinar from February. So principle four, um, which focuses on expanding resources and investing differently to drive economic growth, um, we will be, we'll be focusing on our conversation this morning. Um, and as many of you saw um, across your states in the immediate wake of COVID-19, um, revenues and revenue projections were falling for state and local governments. And so this principle is really around encouraging states to expand the scope of resources and explore innovative and creative ways to supplement funding for higher education. And so this can look like a number of things. So for example, states can examine opportunities to extend borrowing authority, um, waive loan payments, restructure and refinance bond debt, borrowing deeper into rainy day funds or temporarily waiving expensive mandates and cost sharing requirements. States can also certainly leverage federal relief dollars strategically toward equitable outcomes. And we'll get into that more shortly. They can also connect students with other resources that might be um, existing in the state already that those students might be eligible for, such as public benefits that can help students offset their costs for things like food and housing. 
And so in thinking about how states can expand their resources and invest differently for resilient economic growth, some things that state leaders can consider are things like, what are the current capacities of the state to invest in higher education? And how has COVID-19 affected future capacity to invest? And so that includes looking at things like the size of the state's economy and the state's tax revenue data. State leaders can also consider whether there are additional opportunities to explore um, to increase state revenues for post-secondary or other equitable priorities. So for example, for many states, this can include looking at lottery revenue allocations or exploring perhaps some public-private partnerships. State leaders should also consider whether there are opportunities to leverage and align other workforce investments in the state and should also keep in mind whether there is a broad set of stakeholders in the state that can help ensure action on funding and policy recommendations related to higher education. And so again, this is meant to be a framework that states can use in the short term, which means um, using every financial flexibility that is available to the state to weather the economic costs of the pandemic. And in the longer term, which means a perhaps doing a longer examination and developing some options for more revenue sources that might be more recession proof in the future. And so given current conditions, one very clear application of principle four is around the federal relief dollars that are available to states in response to COVID-19. And so this table provides a breakdown of some of those resources that are available to states through federal relief. We had that first round of relief last year in 2020, which came through the CARES Act, which made $150 billion available for direct state and local relief, 139 billion of which went directly to states. Also part of the CARES Act was 14 billion that went to institutions with 50% of that being allocated directly for student emergency aid. About 13.2 billion for K-12 and 3 billion which was for education but which provided governors with some flexibility in determining how to use those funds. We had a second round of federal relief which was passed in December and signed in January. Uh, which provided 21 billion for institutions, again, with about 50% of that going toward um, emergency aid for students, 54 billion for K-12, and 4 billion in additional um, gear dollars, which again provided some of that flexibility. And most recently, we've had the American Rescue Plan, which is providing 350 billion for state and local relief, 220 billion of which is going directly to states, 40 billion to institutions, about 122 billion for K-12. And as someone who analyzes policy, I will tell you that my analysis of these policy is that that's a lot of money. Um, and so we're, we're re really hearing from folks in the field who recognize the opportunity that these funds really represent and who really wanna be good stewards of those funds and want to put them to the best use possible. And so I did just want to um, provide a few examples of how states are using these resources. And certainly we will hear from Peter and Teresa about how they are thinking about some of these pieces in Virginia and Indiana. So first I would like to highlight North Carolina. North Carolina saw that in their state about 30% of adults who had planned to enroll in college in 2020 had to cancel their plans. And about half of those students, um, half of those individuals stated that they were canceling their plans because of changes in their income. Um, additionally, North Carolina is on track for a shortfall in the number of adults with credentials by 2030. And so in response to COVID-19 and these um, challenges that were already in place, the governor allocated $15 million of gear dollars. Again, that is that flexible pot of money to the community college system. And that money was so that the community college system could provide tuition assistance to students who enroll in short-term training programs that lead to credentials in high demand fields in the state. And I've listed those fields um, on this slide. And I did just wanna note that of the 15 million, about 14.5 million was allocated directly for the scholarships and about 500,000 um, was for marketing and communications, which is something um, important for states to consider as well, right? How do we make sure that the students that we want to serve um, actually know about the opportunities and resources that are available to them? And how do we make sure that they can actually access those dollars and, and put them to use? Next is Missouri. Missouri launched a new initiative called Return Strong, and they funded this in part with gear dollars, but also with that direct state relief CARES funding. And so Missouri created a training fund that individuals in the state who want to or need to reskill and upskill in the COVID era can access. And so residents can enroll at certain institutions in the state for that training 
or they can receive funding to um, pursue training opportunities through other um, providers, including Coursera or through the state's Apprentice Connect portal. Um, additionally, the state is organizing virtual job fairs through this initiative as well um, as providing other supports for um, participants, including providing assistance and information about how to apply for unemployment benefits in the interim while they pursue training um, and, and look for a job. And I also did just want to reiterate, um, as Susan mentioned, these slides will be available um, on the MEC website after the presentation. And I have included um, links to each of these resources um, initiatives so that if you are interested in learning more um, about some of these, you can certainly follow up there. Another state I wanted to highlight is Texas. One of the things that Texas is doing with its gear funding is investing in modernizing their data infrastructure. So their goal is to leverage new technologies that will allow for uh, more deep dives um, and analyses on education and workforce data, and to make sure that that data is more useful and accessible to students, families, institutions, and policymakers. And so the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board is leading this effort and they have identified a number of areas where based on feedback from institutions, um, they've identified as real opportunities for growth and improvement in their data system. So these include things like having access to more timely data, having clear definitions about the data um, and having a better user interface and experience. And I wanted to highlight Texas because this is a good example of a state being mindful about that longer term piece um, as well, right? Texas certainly has a number of other initiatives that they are funding through these federal relief dollars that are more responsive to the more urgent needs of COVID-19. But this investment in the modernization of their data infrastructure is something that will um, support their education and workforce efforts even beyond the immediate scope of COVID. And so I wanted to highlight that for folks to consider as well. And finally, I wanted to touch on Rhode Island, certainly a smaller state, um, but one is that that is also being creative and innovative in how they are using their, their federal dollars. So Ro Rhode Island Governor Raimondo, who is now serving as Secretary of Commerce in the Biden administration, allocated 45 million of the state relief CARES funding to launch an initiative called Back to Work Rhode Island. And so this initiative is a public-private partnership where employers are engaged in identifying their talent needs using a skills-based approach. Um, and so the employers pledge to open work opportunities for residents of Rhode Island, and they have access to hiring individuals who participate in the program. And so participants who um, choose to um, work with the program work with a career coach closely who helps them navigate the process both to access training programs as well as to help them look for employment. And one of the unique things about this program is that it also provides wraparound services. So folks who um, are interested in participating and who need additional supports, such as childcare or transportation, access to technology or language supports, can access those resources directly through the program as well so that they don't face additional barriers as they try to secure um, training and employment. So I wanted to highlight that for folks as well. And before I transition to um, introducing Peter and Teresa, I did just want to leave you with this reminder, which is that, you know, this past year has certainly been full of unimaginable and incredible challenges for your states and institutions. Um, but these federal dollars really do present a unique and in some ways historic opportunity to make some really significant investments in strategic ways that will have a positive impact on post-secondary opportunity and equity. And so I thank you for, um, Having me join you this morning, I'd like to introduce our panelists in transition to that conversation. So I'll just stop sharing my screen here. Great, and with that, I will introduce our panelists. So I'm joined, as I mentioned, um, by Peter Blake and Teresa Levers. Peter has been the director of the State Council for Higher Education for Virginia since 2012. He previously worked at CHEV overseeing higher education analyses in the areas of faculty and staff compensation, higher education funding policies, academic libraries, distance learning and instructional technology, and student financial aid. Peter also brings a multitude of additional perspectives to our conversation this morning. He previously served as a legislative fiscal analyst for the Virginia General Assembly's House Appropriations Committee, and he served as Deputy Secretary of Education and Secretary of Education under former Governor Mark Warner. He's also served as a Vice Chancellor of Workforce Development Services for the Virginia Community College System, where he led policy and budget development for state and federal workforce programs. Thank you for joining us, Peter. 
Teresa was appointed in 2009 to serve as Commissioner for Indiana's Commission for Higher Education. She partners with policymakers and higher education leaders to develop and implement the state's higher education strategic plans, including the commission's recently adopted plan, Reaching Higher in a State of Change. Teresa, much like Peter, also brings a multitude of additional perspectives. Prior to joining the commission, she served in the Indiana State Senate for 17 years, leading on education and development issues as chair of the Senate Education and Career Development Committee. She also serves as the chair of Indiana's Governor's Workforce Cabinet, which was formed in 2018 to address current and future education and employment needs for individuals and employers in Indiana. And so with that, I do want to transition um, to a conversation and start with you, Peter. Um, you know, I, I left the group with, with this notion about how these federal relief dollars serve as a unique opportunity to reprioritize how um, post-secondary finance decisions are made and how COVID-19 really has been a catalyst for a lot of uh, states and institutions and systems to re-examine the inequities that exist in, in higher education. But for Virginia, um, your state actually began some of this work to re-examine and reprioritize um, pre-COVID. And so would love um, if you could share how your state has been able to leverage that good work um, or how that work has shifted in response to, to COVID-19. Yeah, thanks Elizabeth and welcome. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, Elizabeth, I think you've said it all already. And I, I really appreciate your comment about my analysis is that's a lot of money. Um, that, that's pretty profound. And I, I think we then owe it to um, our constituents, the people in our states and across the nation to make sure that we use that money wisely the way you and Susan have described. So it's a real honor to be here. I always enjoy uh, being with Teresa Lubbers. I see uh, Blake Flanders is on the call as well. Blake, nice to, nice to know that you're out there uh, continually doing good things. And um, so thanks to Susan as well. I do have a little bit of mech connections just because I was born in Cincinnati. So I have lots of reason to continue to come back and visit family and friends in, in that part of, of, the, of the state. Um, this conversation reminds me a little bit of context that I often use in setting up any kind of conversation along these lines. And that's the kind of the, the, the looming clouds on the horizon and, and the, the, the big looming clouds, and they have been for a while, are, are demography, um, the, uh, kind of a um, uh, economic and social imperative to have more people with higher levels of education and then resource constraints. And the, the demographic changes that we are experiencing and we will continue to experience is that some of the fastest growing segments of our population are those that we in higher education historically have served less well. So that comes at a time, as I said, where the economy and our society demands higher levels of education from more people um, and during a period of enormous resource constraint. So I, the, the opportunities and challenges for higher education are greater and more important than they've ever been. And, and then add to it um, technological upheaval and of course uh, some of the social justice upheaval that we are experiencing real time every day. Uh, the, the world is, I think Susan said it at the beginning, in need of more higher education, better higher education, more focused and widespread higher education than ever before. So it's, it's an, an honor to be here to talk a little bit about it. And thank you for letting me say some about the momentum that Virginia has built up over the last couple of years that I think do position us well. Um, I'll, I'll give a shout out to Strategy Labs here at the very beginning. They worked with us very closely on a project a couple of years ago on a strategic finance plan for Virginia uh, that not only showed where we have been and where we are and our different areas of opportunity, but laid a, a groundwork for where to go next. And, and you don't do those things in a vacuum. You have to do those with a lot of partners. And, and so part of the momentum that we have in Virginia builds on the partnerships that we have with our presidents. I meet with them uh, you know, between eight and 10 times a year, um, even more so over the last year with COVID. Uh, the partnerships that you have to develop with the legislative folks, the legislative staff and the governor's office. Um, and of course, our own council members, 13 members appointed by the governors, all as one member says, all type AAA personalities. So. Uh, you got a lot of momentum, a lot of people that, that um, uh, have good ideas uh, that you want to accommodate in, 
in consensus building and in coming up with solutions. So I think that momentum has certainly served us well. And we've seen some, some major initiatives come out of Virginia. Um, this year alone, we did finally get some money for a, um, a, a study and to redesign our funding models, building off that 2019 study that I mentioned with HCM. And it has as, a, as an ingredient listed in the Appropriation Act, um, a greater focus on equity. And so we have a challenge now to figure out the best way to develop funding formulas to account for, for that, among other factors, of course. That might not have happened, that would not have happened had we not had the momentum that we've seen already. Virginia, like many other states, um, now has a free community college um, initiative that was funded in the last General Assembly session. The governor called it G3. It's um, get, 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 a, get a skill, get a job, and give back. G3, and, and so it's a, an income-based free community college uh, initiative that's targeted to selected high need programs. Uh, so we'll be rolling that out in cooperation with our community college system here over uh, the upcoming year. The legislature did include, um, Elizabeth, to one of your points, $5 million for marketing and outreach, um, a very essential ingredient. It also includes a cash bonus above last dollar um, to incentivize people to go full time. So if, if an extra thousand or fifteen hundred dollars can permit you not to have to work as many hours such that you can complete your college education more rapidly, then that's a feature with uh, that we've done with that. There are a number of other things that I can get into a little bit later. We did revise our uh, state funding allocation formula for need-based financial aid. We have a program of need-based aid of about $250 million. The revisions allowed us to drive more money to those institutions that enroll the most low income students. It seems like a natural, but we had a few features in there that held that back. And we were able to, again, working with partners around Capitol Square to make the modifications necessary to that formula. So uh, I'll conclude by noting that now, as we have a lot of money and federal money, uh, at least for a period of time, and we have to talk about how you use that wisely such that when it goes away, you're not left holding the bag in a way that you can't reasonably do so. But um, I, I won't quite say that we, we've got the full muscle memory in place, but I think we got a lot more of it now because of the momentum around some of the kinds of things that we've done over the last few years in Virginia and the partnerships that we've built from K-12 uh, into the workforce that I think will be meaningful uh, as we apply some of, some of our lessons learned and that, that, um, that lens uh, to spending the federal money. So um, I'll pause there and, and uh, we can come back to some of the other points later on. Absolutely, thank you. And as someone who focuses on affordability and a lot of my work really excited about um, Virginia's free college program. And I think there are a lot of aspects that I would like to change about a lot of the free college programs out there. And it's great to see a state that is really being intentional and, and with the equity focus um, around their free college. Um, also really want, want to um, emphasize this idea you, you mentioned around building momentum and how you don't do things in a vacuum, right? You really have to develop partnerships and build on that work um, over time. And would love to turn to you, Teresa. Um, you similarly had some of that momentum over time um, in place pre-COVID with the um, governor's workforce cabinet. Um, would love to see if you could share um, how the work of that group has pivoted um, in the immediate um, aftermath of COVID-19 and how has that work continued to evolve um, a year now into the pandemic. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you to MEC for inviting uh, Peter and me to present to you today. Um, Actually, I have a long history with MEC. Uh, it goes back more than 20 years since I've been a commissioner or uh, an alternate or had the privilege to serve as chair of MEC many, many years ago as well. So a strong commitment to the work that MEC does on behalf of the Midwest. Uh, Peter mentioned that uh, he has a contact, you know, grew up in um, Ohio. Um, he also has an Indiana contact. He worked for Mark Warner who actually graduated from high school in Indiana, which I remind him about sometimes. So we're really not that far apart, even though our regions do have special needs. Um, I also want to have a, a shout out to HCM, who certainly helped has helped us with our strategic plans, both our current one, Reaching Higher in a State of Change, and our previous plan as well, um, and helped us with our funding formula, which we're in the process of uh, passing today or tomorrow, uh, with a added emphasis on equity in this formula as well. 
So I'm um, very hopeful that it will look good. Um, in just a brief note about Indiana's uh, financial situation, we just did our revenue forecast and it came in $2 billion above our estimates. Our unemployment rate has now dropped to 3.9%. And so there is a much more generous attitude in the legislature right now about funding some of those things that we think are important. But in particular, Elizabeth asked me to share some thoughts about what we've done with the governor's workforce cabinet and how we've used this moment in time to really talk about the relationship between education and economic development. And um, I think you know all of our states can talk about important good work that we're doing. And I think it's all really focused on making sure that more individuals in our states have economic mobility. And certainly that was the motivation behind the creation of the governor's workforce um, cabinet. Early on, um, Governor Holcomb really tasked a multi-state task force to actually look at how we would actually meet the needs of employers and improve economic mobility and strengthen the state's economy as well. Um, we called this initiative Rapid Recovery for a Better Future. It really included uh, three components. One was what we refer to as next level jobs, and I'll talk about that for a moment. Uh, the, an outreach network, which really tried to bring together uh, focus on meeting people where they are. And then finally, our employer and education, educator uh, outreach as well, working specifically with organizations like our, our Chamber of Commerce and our state's uh, community college system. But all of these efforts that we had were really focused, as the name would indicate, helping Hoosiers go to the next level wherever they were and giving them hope that they could actually do that. A better job, um, whatever that looked like, a new job, uh, additional training. Um, we really focused on five sectors in Indiana's economy that we provided tuition-free certificates. We were doing this prior to COVID, and then I'll talk a little bit about what happened after COVID. But this was, we were looking at quality certificates in the area of advanced manufacturing, IT and business, health and life sciences, logistics and transportation, and building and construction. And what we knew that is that if someone would get one of these certificates, that they would get a better job. Um, and in fact, this has proven to be the case. Um, those who have completed the annual median wage gain has been $6,800. And so um, it's, it's, it's working and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, as was mentioned, the governor's workforce cabinet was created in 2018. And we had to get permission from the Department of Labor because this is our state's workforce board which means that the majority of membership will be employers, but we've also brought in all of the state agencies and community leaders who would be helpful in this regard as well. We used um, initially uh, $50 million of the CARES dollars to really look at how we could build and scale what was happening with the governor's workforce cabinet. So we spent uh, $22 million of that to expand the workforce ready grant uh, we expanded by, uh, we went from 150 certificates to 200. We actually, in the past, we did not allow someone who had a degree already to come back and get one of those certificates. But we, because we saw such displacement, especially in hospitality and in manufacturing, we expanded the kinds of certificates and we allowed people who already had a degree to come back and get a quality certificate. We used $3 million for what's called 180 Skills, which is a company that really uh, creates online uh, modules of learning in the non-credit space. Uh, and we use $15 million for the employer training grant, which is the companion piece to the Workforce Ready Grant. The Workforce Ready Grant is for the individual to get a high quality certificate. The employer training grant pays for employers to train incumbent or new workers. We used $8 million for career coaching uh, really knowing that many of these uh, individuals were overwhelmed by government programs, uh, what they needed to do. And we were just, we knew that we needed to, to be more hands-on with that. Uh, we used a million dollars to actually scale up prior learning assessments so that we could dignify people's learning in other places. Uh, we actually are getting additional funding during this legislative session to create a clearinghouse for prior learning assessments. And then we actually had a million dollars to actually brand the programs. We then came back and I won't tell you all the ways in which we spent it, but we got an additional $25 million to scale these programs as well, especially our marketing efforts, um, because we found that um, a lot of people really needed to be contacted by someone who knew them. 
a pastor, a community leader. Uh, and so we've really worked our outreach efforts in this regard as well. We uh, created an online hub, which is called Rapid Recovery. And it, the hub is called Your Next Step IN, which is Indiana. And it's a one-stop resource where you can go to that. You don't have a high school diploma, it sends you someplace. You have some college and no degree, it sends you someplace else. You need a quality certificate. You're an employer. And it's it's uh, we've tried to make it as simple as possible so that with just sort of one step, you end up at the place you need to be. I'm gonna mention just a little bit more about um, uh, the results of this as I we now have uh, close to 44,000 Hoosiers who are enrolled in one of these high quality programs. We have over 22,000 who have completed one of those. Um, we have in the employer space over 7,000 employers who are working in this space as well. And we've had special focus on equity because as we all know, you know, this, the, as Elizabeth mentioned and Peter mentioned, this has had a disproportionate impact on low income and students of color. And what we have found is that with the Workforce Ready Grant, we are actually seeing enrollments among Black Hoosiers in the Workforce Ready Grant program at a higher percentage than the Black population of the state, which is not true of our other programs. Uh, so we've seen 15% enrollments that from Black Hoosiers compared to a little less than 10% of our state's population. About $8 million has gone to 163 minority and women and veterans owned businesses, particularly with the CARES dollars. And so we really tried to build upon um, the programs that we know are successful for low income and minority uh, students and adults who are coming back. Lots more we can talk about, but I just wanted to highlight some of the programs under Next Level Jobs. Thank you so much. Definitely a, a comprehensive overview of, of the, the good work that is going on um, in Indiana. And I really want to say that I appreciate this notion um, that you mentioned around meeting folks where they are, right? And that looks like a, a multiple multitude of ways. So whether that's uh, meeting folks where they are and ensuring that they are outreached to by someone that they're familiar with um, or being responsive, right? And, and in the wake of COVID-19, those who were displaced, making sure that they had opportunities and um, expanding the credentials that are available for them to pursue. Um, and definitely, you know, building on what, what Peter mentioned earlier about you don't do this work in a vacuum and having to, um, as you mentioned with the workforce cabinet, bringing on not just the employers, but the different state agencies to, to be involved in the work um, as well. Um, you know, I think in, in higher ed, often we are, doing this thing where we're building the plane as we fly it. And so certainly a lot of a lot of efforts and initiatives that you describe, I'm sure have um, presented you with with numerous challenges. Um, and so would love um, if you could share in terms of how you've leveraged the federal dollars, any challenges you have faced um, through that process and any lessons learned that you um, would like to share with folks. And why don't I turn to you first, Peter? Uh, well, just a couple of comments. Um, I'm really impressed by the, the scale of the work in Indiana and the governor and Teresa um, on the programs. We, at the state level, you got a lot more control at the state level with the state level dollars. You don't have as much control at the institutional level. And, and I think that's where we're really trying to get our arms around what that looks like. And, and so again, I think some the goodwill that we've developed over the past year or so with our presidents will make that work a little bit easier. But um, there's always a, a fine dance that you have with institutions on you know, when, when do you put your foot on the gas and when do you take it off on, on the kinds of expectations that you might have with some of those resources. So um, the, the state level dollars, at least the, the gear funds originally are they're large and they're significant, but they're less than what's going on with the institutions. Of course, their needs are enormous as well. So I don't, I don't want to slight that. So I think one of the challenges now that we, we will face is, um, well, two come to mind. One is the, how to get your, a handle around what the institutions are doing and whether we have an ability to help them be more strategic in a coordinated way in using those funds. So that's one. The second is that um, while there are no governor's reserve funds in this latest version, there's a, a huge amount, there's $3.8 billion in Virginia that's, um, that it can be applied to state level initiatives. And of course, um, from K-12 to higher ed, to healthcare, uh, to transportation, uh, anyone can make a credible 
claim on that money. And so one of our challenges, opportunities is to come up with something that's um, coherent and meaningful and forward looking. So those are a couple of things that come to mind right away, Elizabeth. Thank you, I appreciate that. Teresa, I would love to hear um, from you as well. Well, we used the initial uh, governor's um, emergency education relief fund to really deal with the issue of remote education needs in Indiana. We received for that first batch, it was uh, 61.6 a million dollars of which the majority probably actually uh, went to K-12, but higher education was engaged in both the preparation of the teachers and some uh, something or uh, some areas that had to do with uh, how uh, remote learning was being redesigned in higher education as well. In particular, we really looked at device availability. We looked at uh, connectivity, like many states, Indiana has places where um, the, the bandwidth for uh, connectivity is really limited, especially in rural Indiana. But the availability of devices is limited in those places that are um, probably the similarity is poverty, uh, whether it's rural or urban uh, Indiana. And then, as I mentioned, we really worked on educator capacity as well. We did, we put out an RFP. We had about 400 applications of people uh, organizations who wanted to be engaged in this work with the redesign of remote instruction. I think this is one of those areas where we can really talk about the immediate need with the lessons we learn that then become instructive of how we redesign going forward. So it isn't uh, just, you know, what do we do when people have to, they're driving to their McDonald's and sitting in their car for connectivity and how do we um, realize where our gaps are and use this opportunity to jumpstart a different way going forward. There's no doubt that you know, remote instruction and virtual instruction for higher ed and K-12 is going to have a more prevalent place, whatever return actually looks like. And so we've tried to really use this as an opportunity to bring together our Department of Education, our State Board of Education in the K-12 space with the Commission for Higher Education to really um, increase the ability of our K-12 educators and then to really provide remote instruction uh, professional development as well. And then, you know, as we look forward to um, additional funding, um, whether that goes directly to the institutions, or we know in the case of both the third tranche and the third tranche, half of that goes to the individual students who are being served as well. So, um, and we know, as, as Peter mentioned, you know, we've kept track of the millions and millions of dollars that our institutions have spent on testing, tracing, the redesign of, of instruction, um, you know, what this looks like to, to, you know, make the classrooms safe and the housing look better in terms of, you know, secure places for people to come back to. All the costs that are associated with that, um, we know is taking a toll. But we also know that there are millions and millions of dollars that are coming in. And I, I think everyone has already been made reference to the fact of, you know, what will the return on our investment be for the money that we spend? Uh, so uh, I know several folks on the call today have heard me say before, you know, we're, we've been so engaged in talking about how, you know, get this, getting this money out the door, meeting the, the deadlines, which are impractical in many cases, because you can't meet education and training in a really quality way, sometimes in six months. But nonetheless, we've had some limitations, which I think will be less, I think it will be less prescriptive in the future about how we do that. But it's not just how do we get the money out the door, but how do we get the outcomes that we want, uh, which I think should drive that discussion perhaps more than it is uh, because we've felt this uh, sense of urgency to help people, but we don't have to help them in a way that isn't also going to make sure that it really helps them going forward. Did they get a job that was a better job, not just a job? Did they get the training that will help them for the new, for the new economy? Uh, and so, yes, you want to get them a job, but you want to get them a better job. And you want to make sure they're getting the skills that they need. So um, I think um, one of the areas that I think has been really encouraging is, at least in Indiana, and I think this is probably true in other states, is that we are really more than ever engaged in the opportunity for people to live meaningful lives and the predictors of success along the way are integrated, not just, not separate. So it isn't, you know, did a child get off to a, a good start in school? That's absolutely critical. Maybe the most important thing, 
but it's not, it doesn't finish when they start in first grade. You know, third grade reading, eighth grade math, graduating from high school, ready to go to college or with an industry certification, completing college and knowing that what you're studying actually has relevance to what you want to do. I think we're talking about these things in a much more comprehensive and aligned way than we ever have, at least in Indiana. Thank you. Thank you both for, for your willingness to, to be candid and share some of the challenges that, that you're facing in your states. I think um, the piece you both shared around um, how do we help institutions be strategic and coordinated in, in, in the funding that is going directly to them is certainly something um, that we're hearing across the field and that folks really um, are interested in learning more about, right? We know folks wanna be good stewards of the money, but um, like you said, Teresa, the, the deadlines around getting the money out the door certainly um, presents the challenge. And then I think the other thing too that, that you hit upon um, is, is this balance, right? How do we balance sort of meeting the urgent needs in the short term while being strategic and mindful of sustainability. So for that longer term, um, and often we get sort of um, short term vision and just focus on the immediate urgent needs because, you know, people are hurting and people need additional resources. Um, and so we tend to focus on that um, urgent response, but without really stopping to think, as you as you mentioned, what is that longer term impact and making sure that that we keep that in mind as well. Um, I want to thank you um, both for, for your comments and, and willingness to engage this morning. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, so with that, have a great afternoon and stay safe.